Okay, and now the last speaker of the day of the conference is full. Um, we have um, Andy Clevin from Notre Dame to tell us about <coughs> the Johnson Filtration and Spike Injection. Well, thank you very much. And I also, because it's the last talk, it's my great privilege to thank the organizers. <laughs> Tremendously fun conference. Thanks for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks, Tara. You know, so uh, this is all joint with uh, so uh, Tom Church and Mikhail Ershaw. The new results are. So this is a talk about uh, a subgroup of the mapping class group that I don't think we've encountered yet in this conference. So this is the Torelli group. So I'm going to know if by I to G, that's the Torelli group. So what is that? So that is the uh, kernel of the map from the mapping class group to the automorphism group of one, two, of the uh, H1 of the surface. Now what is the automorphism group of H1 of the surface? Well, this is z to the 2g, but it preserves the algebraic intersection pairing, so that really is sp 2g of t. So this is a, a wonderful group, it's one of my favorite groups in math. So, um, and so I want to tell you some things about finiteness properties of this group and its subgroups. So we should first get acquainted with it. So uh, the, uh, maybe I should tell you some elements of it. So there's a theorem of Berman and Powell. And what does it say? It says that the Torelli group is generated by two kinds of things. The first thing you need are, uh, well, separating twists. So these are main twists about curves that separate the surface. So it looks like this. You know, you have your surface. And there is a separating curve of x. And there's taking t of x. So those are inside Torelli. Why are those inside Torelli? Well, if you think about what does the main twist do to homology? So you have a cycle wandering around your surface. Every time you get the curve, you go around it, and you keep going, right? So you're picking up copies of x. And, but x is trivial in homology. x is no homology. So this is inside Torelli. Another element, so these unfortunately do not generate it in general, are what are called a bounding pair, or I'm going to call those BP maps. And what are those? Well, what you do is let's consider, so we're going to have a surface. Here's the surface. So I'm going to need a little extra genus this time. Let's say I have genus 3. Let's say that x and y are disjoint and homologous. So what does that mean? That means that their union separates the surface. So there's x and there's y. And then if we take the Dane twist about x and the Dane twist about y inverse, that's an element of Torelli. So why is that an element of Torelli? Well, simply because x and y are homologous. So the Dane twist do the same thing with homology. If you just think about that, that recipe I told you before. So since these are the same, do the same thing in homology, we're doing something and undoing it. So this is inside Torelli. So these two elements of the Torelli group generate it. So now, as I said, this talk is about finiteness properties of the Torelli group. So what should we expect? Well, the mapping class group, of course, is the best group in the world, right? It has every finiteness property you could ever possibly hope a group would have. It's finally generated. It's finally presented. It has a high over of a plane space, which is finally many cells in each dimension. It's called modulized space, more or less. You know, so it's, it's a great group, but the Torelli group is an infinite index normal subgroup. And what happens when you pass to an infinite index subgroup of a group? Well, typically all hell breaks loose, right? Like think about a free group. A free group of rank two is the, you know, it's an even better group in some ways. You know, but it's a common hitter subgroup. I mean, what's that, right? It's a huge infinitely generated free group. And so we might expect that nothing good is true about the Torelli group. And uh, in some cases, that's sort of true. So there's a famous theorem of McCullough and Miller that says in genus two, it's not finally generated. And that was improved by Metz. In his PhD thesis, who showed that Torelli 2 is an infinite rank free group. That's a pretty big group, a pretty bad group. And so you might think, well, maybe it just gets worse as the genus increases. But in fact, we have the following uh, sort of really remarkable theorem of Dennis Johnson, which is in contrast to that, that says that uh, for g at least 3, Torelli g is generated by finitely many, and I'll say this, uh, genus 1, b 
be p mass. Now, genus 1 in that case just refers to the fact that, like that one up there, it cuts off one of the, on one of the two sides, there's a genus 1 surface. Okay? So this is a remarkable theorem, as I said. Uh, you know, there's, there's basically still only one proof of it known, and that proof gives no insight into why it's true. So I think it's just a magic theorem. Like there's, I have no idea why it's true. Except, I mean, I know I verified it. But, so anyway, so it's, a, and it's an open question. Is the Torelli group finally presented or not? We have no idea. And I, I'm not going to even hazard a guess. So what I'm interested in, though, are not just the Torelli group, but its subgroups. And there's an important sequence of subgroups that I want to talk about. So the definition. So if you have a G as a group, so just to remind you, the lower central series <coughs> of G is defined, just I'll show you my indexing conventions. So gamma 1 of G is G itself, and gamma n plus 1 of G is the commutators of gamma n of G and G. So for instance, gamma 2 is the commutator sub of the group. And so I'm interested in the uh, lower central series of the Torelli group. And it turns out that the, um, you know, each of those, you go deeper and deeper in the lower central series, this is a sequence of infinite index subgroups of the Torelli group. So you know, they have less and less of a right to have any good properties at all. Uh, now, you might think why these are sort of strange groups, you know, so one result that sort of might make them all feel a little bit more concrete is the following theorem of Johnson, which sheds some light into at least what the first one looks like. So what he showed is, is that if you look at just the commutator subgroup, so gamma 2 of, of Torelli, so that's the commutator subgroup, so that is finite index, right to me. In, well, the group, and this is a very natural group called KG, which is the subgroup generated by Dane Twist about separating curves. Okay, so, you know, separating curves in general are not enough to generate the Torelli group. They generate this infinite index subgroup, which is more or less the commutator subgroup. Okay? And so, in particular, any finiteness properties of KG are also finiteness properties of the commutator subgroup, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the groups I'm interested in right here. And so, as I said, they have even less of a right to have any good properties in the Torelli group. So, you know, what can people say? So, I think uh, for a long time there was basically, you know, I think the expectation <coughs> was pretty bad. There's a, you know, famous theorem by a failed gubernatorial candidate of in, uh, Illinois that, you know, said that they're not finally generated. It's unfortunately not correct. So, uh, you know, he's a very good politician. And the, uh, so we have a, you know, but so, so, so I think people, but I think that was the conventional wisdom for many years, that these groups should not be finally generated. And the first break in that is a theorem of Jim Kem Pagadima. Which I think was maybe, uh, you know, I'm guessing 2008 maybe, something around there. So it says that in fact, uh, oh, uh, yeah, okay, so this by the way is for G at least. This is G at least three here. So Dimkan Papadima, what they showed was that if you look at H1 of this Johnson kernel subgroup with Q coefficients, that is finite dimensional. For G at least four. So that was the first hint that these should have some sort of nice finiteness properties. And the proof of this is remarkable. I mean, it uses deep results in arithmetic geometry. I mean, it seems it has very little to do with the Mackin class group itself. So that was, you know, I think a great shock to the system when that came out. And so people thought maybe these are, you know, these would be nice groups. But the, there was not a lot of progress on them for a long time until a theorem of Ershov and Hay, which was last year. And what does that say? They showed that, in fact, KG is finitely generated for G at least 12. So when I saw that paper came out, you know, this was an even bigger shock to the system. You know, the proof was very sort of intricate and combinatorial, and somehow it only worked for G at least 12, which is how often you see 12 come up. You know, I don't know. I don't know of any properties that a genus 12 surface has that you know lower genus surface has done. So you know, so you might think, you know, this is probably not optimal. And so that brings me to the main theorem. This is the, the main theorem I want to talk about today. So, so today's theorem, which is uh, myself, as I said, it's Church, 
Air Show. And Putman, also 2017. So it says that if you look at the lower central series, gamma k of the Torelli group is finitely generated. So we can go quite deep in the lower central series for uh, g greater than or equal to, well, let's say the maximum of 4 and 2k minus 1. Okay? So you can go deep, the, you know, if you want to get to the 10th term of the lower central series, yeah, it's enough for the genus to be about 19. So, and then these things are going to become, start becoming currently generated. And, in, and we also, as you can see, we also get uh, kg is currently generated for g at least 4, which is, I suspect, an optimal result. So I, I don't know, genus 3 is open, I don't know the answer to that case. What is the nature of the techniques and the SUV? Well, so, so I'll, let me say about, more about that in a second. So the, um, so, so Ershaw and Hay, uh, you know, they, they, they used a theory of BNS invariance, which is the same thing that we're, I'm going to use to discuss the theorem today, uh, in a sort of very sort of complicated and combinatorial way. And what I think I'm going to do today is I'm going to give a complete proof. This is, this, this is the, uh, my aspiration for this talk. So goal, so the proof of this whole theorem is quite complicated. Dealing with deep terms deep in the lower central series is really, really hard. You know, they get really, really messy. But the goal today is to prove that uh, Kg is finitely generated <coughs> for G at least 4. And, you know, somehow, I mean, like the idea, you know, as I said, Ershop and Hay, you know, they used the BNS and various and so are we, but we're going to use them in somewhat different ways. So, so that's what I want to do. And it's sort of remarkable, I think, the proof we kept making it easier and easier and easier. We were sure of worried eventually it would become false, you know, these things keep getting easier enough. But, you know, <laughs> thankfully the process stopped eventually. So, you know, so this is, so I think I'll be able to give you basically a complete proof of this. So this is why I'm going to do this. Are there any questions about that before I move on? So, as I sort of intimated, the main tool is the theory of the BNS invariance. So that's what I want, that's what I need to talk about next. So BNS stands for Bieri, Neumann, and Strudel. So, here is the definition. This will be our main tool for understanding finiteness properties of groups like, say, the commutator subgroup of the Torelli group. So let's say that G is a, G is a uh, group so with a finite gen set S. And so I want to define a few things about this. I want to talk about some sort of geometric group theory type things that you might hope to understand. So the first thing is, is I'm going to have to talk about characters of this group. So I'm just going to know those by G star. So G star, that's just going to be my name for Hom from G to R. So this is R to the something, right? It's, it's a finite dimensional real vector space depending on the number of elements inside our terror set. So, okay, so we have uh, the dual. And so <coughs> the BS invariant, the sort of main tool we're going to use to prove this result, is a certain subset of this. Okay, so here is the definition of the BNS invariant. So uh, let me go, uh, actually, I'm going to do it on the upper lower side. Of the so here's the next part. So, so the Bieri Neumann Strabel invariant of G so it is the set of all rho inside uh, is the set, actually I'll write it like this. So it's going to be denoted by sigma of G. And it's the set of all rho inside the dual of G, all homomorphisms from G to R, such that the following is true, such that the subgraph of the Cayley graph of G <coughs> span by G inside G with rho of G squared equal to zero is connected. Okay, that's sort of a thing you can look at. If you have a you have a number associated to every element of your group, you know, you can then decorate the Cayley graph, you put that number at every vertex, and you ask yourself, you know, is the associated subgraph where this is positive or not negative, is that a connected subgraph or not? Okay. So I'm going to do some examples in a second. This is sort of hard to wrap your mind around the first time you encounter it. So, but, uh, so here are some remarks about this. So the first remark is that this is independent of generating set. That is not obvious at all when you first saw it. And so I, 
you know, once, once you stop following this talk, I recommend proving it for yourself. It is an incredibly fun little bit of geometric proof that you're proof this doesn't depend upon the generating set. Sort of move off really hard of humanity and then you can change generating sets and, you know. So it's, it's a very sort of, like sort of soft geometric argument, the sort of thing that geometric proof theory like. So this is independent of the generating set. So another thing you might want to say is sort of like, what, what, what sort of things, this is some subset, you know, it's a subset of G star, which has a topology. And in fact, uh, this so sigma g is a cone on an open subset of, a, of the uh, sphere in G star, which is ordered to R to the you know some big n, whatever big n is. Okay. And in fact, people often projectivize or take the positive projectivization and say it's actually an open subset of the sphere. Okay. But it's sort of more convenient this talk not to projectivize. So this is a, it's an, it, it, so it's open. That's also not obvious at all. You know, so now changing generate when you if you perturb your character just a little bit, that's going to cause repercussions all throughout deep in the kilogram. So it, it's not at all obvious that this is going to be open. That you don't sort of shove stuff out that you need to move between things deep in the kilogram. So okay, so that's uh, th th those are two things. And so, but I think as I said, I think it's best to work out some examples to get some sense of what's going on here. So that's what I'm going to do next. So. Let's see here. And so I'm going to work out, as I said, some very easy examples. There are sort of two groups that, uh, whose Cayley graphs I know how to draw on the board. Those are free groups and free abelian groups. And so, yeah, those are also the, the easiest ones to analyze, as you might imagine. And, and I think that they also exhibit some features of this that I'm going to bring out later on. So in example one, let's try to figure out what the B and S invariant of z to the n. Okay, so what's going on here? So what we have, well, what does the Cayley graph look like? Of course, it is the uh, our favorite grid, right? Let's say, um, I don't know. Let's say that's the origin right there. And then what is our character row? You know, our character row is a homomorphism from z to the n to r, right? And so if you look at the the the, the zero set, so this is going to be Maybe I should use a little bit of color here. So I don't know what colors work well and which ones don't, but we'll find out. So if I look at rho is equal to zero, that's rho, uh, rho is equal to zero right there. And here is the uh, sort of rho greater than or equal to zero on that side right there. You can just sort of look and say, oh, of course that's connected, right? You know, you sort of you have most of the grid to work with. You know, you start. Whatever sort of half plane or half space you're looking at, you just sort of go out deep in there, and then you can connect any two points. You'll get access to the entire grid. So in fact, <coughs> that is the whole character, the whole set of characters. Alien. So that's one example right here. So let's look at another example. I have room on this board to do that. So, so let's try to think about the BNS invariant of the free group and two generators. And what could that possibly be? So let's just think about, let's consider, so rho going from f2 to r, so defined by rho of, say, you know, so let's let f2 be generated by a and b, and rho of a is 1, rho of b is equal to 0. So I can send a and b to whatever numbers I want, and these are the first ones you might think about doing. And so let's draw ourselves a little picture of the Cayley graph and see what's going on with this. So our Cayley graph, of course, is our tree, right? So we have our, you know, I'm, only, I'm not a very fast art drawer, so I'm only going to draw it here. And so on. Okay, and so let's say that this is the A edge right there, and that's the B edge. Okay, so let's draw in red the uh, things where this is greater than or equal to zero, okay? So first, of course, the, or the identity is always in there, right? Because the identity goes to zero. That's non-negative. Uh, we also know that we can go up to B, that's no problem at all. Like there, we can go by A, and that's not a problem at all. We can go by B. We can go by, you know, by, you know, B inverse right there, that's not a problem, and so on. We can start picking up lots and lots of stuff. We can go, you know, we go like down there, we can go over there. If there's a lot of stuff we're going to pick up if we keep doing this, you know, I'm I'm not going to do it, but this part is not. A inverse is definitely not inside here, right there. 
So, and neither is, um, and now I'm going to start, I, I'm going to regret the fact that I didn't make this side a bit larger. Let's say it's right there. So A inverse is not inside it. Uh, a inverse B is still not inside it. But look, that point right there is what? That is A inverse uh, B times A. And look, that's inside it again, right? Because that goes to zero. And similarly, I can go up, you know, and I can go to the right there. And look, I'm seeing another component sort of erupting right here on this part of the paleograph. And if you start you know, thinking about this, you can sort of move, get lots and lots of components. You get infinitely many components from all throughout the paleograph. And so you see that this guy is definitely not. So rho is definitely not inside the DNS invariant of F2. And you can imagine the same sort of argument. You know, you can just sort of cause more and more connected components to occur no matter what values I put A and B to be. And in fact, the, the, uh, except for zero. And so the DNS invariant in that case is just the zero character. Okay, so those are sort of two contrasting things that can happen with the DNS invariant. Another one, which I won't, uh, I think because of the interest of time, I won't write down. So the BNS invariant of, um, you know, one, one example I think would be familiar to a lot of people in this audience. If you look at a hyperbolic trim manifold that fibers over the circle, the, uh, the BNS invariant is the cone on all the open fibered faces. Okay? So that's another important example. And so I think in many ways you can sort of view the BNS invariant as a generalization of the, uh, the thir you know, sort of like a Thurston norm kind of thing or something like that. So, is the number of components independent of the generating set, or is it more subtle than that? That you have to really just. I mean, yeah, I'm not. Ex I, I am not so a hundred percent sure. Really, it's more subtle. You, you got I mean, you know, the, 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 the proof is really bare and You sort of just try to find a path. So, I think the number of components. I mean, the number of components is probably usually infinite if it's not connected. So, but I'm not hundred percent sure of that. But I think that's most. That's usually true. I said, if you look at a hyperbolic three manifold, the uh, the BNS invariant <coughs> is the cone on the interiors of the fiber faces. So, and that right there should motivate the following result. So, what's the main result of the BNS invariant? Why does it have anything to do with these sorts of questions I've been talking about? So, we have uh, I think this is the main result. This is due to Beery, Norman, and Strabel, and it's kind of a shocking theorem. So, this is the uh, theorem. Gary, Neumann, and Strabel, uh, maybe in sometime in the 80s. And so what did they show? What they showed, so we're going to look at a group G. So G is a finitely generated group. So it's a finitely generated group. And let's say that H is a normal sub, is a subgroup that lies between the commutator subgroup of G H and G. So we have a subgroup H along between the commutator subgroup of G and G itself. Okay? So then the following are equivalent. So we have that H is finitely generated if and only if we have the following thing about the BNS invariant. So if you look at all rho uh, which are inside G star, so remember that right there is HOM from G R such that rho restricted to H is equal to zero, so all characters that vanish on H, we want that to be contained inside the BNS invariant for G. So the BNS invariant knows all about which subgroups of G contain the commentary subgroup of finitely generated. This is, as I said, this is not a, an obvious result. You should be surprised when you see it. Uh, the example of hyperbolic three manifolds maybe sort of makes it sort of maybe a little bit more believable. I mean, the cones and the fibered faces, those are exactly the things for fibers, right? The fibers, you know, the fiber of the kernel will be, well, the, the surface of the fiber, right? So that's, and I guess that's, if you think about how it's, uh, how you, uh, how you, how, how you, you prove that, I mean, you, 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 the whole point is showing that the kernel is finally generated in that case, right? Because then you can use this theorem of Stallings that says that, mapped as the circle, there's a kernel, you know, kernel and pi 1 is kind of generated, that's going to actually give you a vibration of your three manifold. So those are sort of the generals, as I this is, you should think of this as a sort of generalization of the Thurston norm in that context. So this is quite a remarkable theorem. Uh, well, there's sort of two directions to this, that's another comment I should make. So the uh, direction that shows, so this direction <coughs> right here, maybe get a piece of some colored chalk. So here, 
I keep losing. I'm only using one color and I lose it every time. Uh, this direction right there, that's pretty easy. It sort of comes down to the fact that this is independent of the generating set. So you can see, uh, you know, well, maybe I should make the comment that this is reflected in these two examples, of course. You know, every subgroup of z to the n is finitely generated, but normal subgroups of f2 are never finitely generated unless they're finite index. Okay? So, and you see, like, if you, uh, if you know that h is finitely generated, then you can choose a generating set for g. You start off with a generating set for h, and then throw some more stuff in there, right? And you sort of basically reduce to the z to the n kind of case. Okay, so, so, you, so once, once you can sort of move horizontally by, you can move within inside this h, inside h, you can move within the kernel of rho, right? Then you can just reduce to the fact that it's all of them. You know, we're, we're sort of working on a grid right there. So that's the easy direction. The hard direction is this direction. So this direction is hard. Yeah, it's a compactness argument. You just throw more and more generators in there. And I, I think it's uh, you know, maybe an important feature of this is that it's not actually, it doesn't actually give you a generating set. This is not like, you know, I take this data and I just write down <coughs> the generating set. You know, there's, it's, it's an it is an ineffective argument. You don't even get a bound on how big the generating set's going to be. So it's sort of, it's sort of a giant mess. So, okay, so that's going to be our main tool. So are there any questions about the BNS invariant? That's going to be, we're going to be using that a lot. So I now want to relate this. I want to use this to study the Torelli group. And so how am I going to do that? And I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be time-wise. So here is our new goal. Right here. So I'm going to restate our goal theorem, but I'm going to state it in terms of the BNS invariant. So our goal theorem is the following. And it should say that the BNS invariant of the Torelli group, that right there is equal to all of Torelli G star. So the entire dual for G at least four. So by Miriam and Schrable's theorem, that's equivalent to this, the commutator subgroup being finally generated. Okay? So this is what I'm going to prove. And I'm going to sort of write down the steps of it here and then use the rest of the boards to sort of prove the steps. I'm going to leave these things up here. So I want to talk about this right now. So my uh, so I'm going to, the proof is going to have two steps. So step one. What does step one say? It says that uh, there exists a finite generating, a special finite generating set for the Torelli group. So there exists a uh, finite gen set, so S for Torelli G, so consisting of genus 1 BP maps, those basic elements I wrote down at the beginning of the talk. Now, so far, like we already know this, this is what Dennis Johnson proved, right? But such that this has something with the BNS invariant, so such that if you look at all characters, rho, of the Torelli group such that rho of s is non-zero for all of its s inside s, such that that right there is all contained inside of BNS invariant for Torelli. So this first step produces a bunch of elements inside the BNS invariant. Not, not all of them, okay? I mean, not all, you know, there's going to be a lot of characters in the Torelli group, and they're definitely, some of them are going to vanish on whatever generating set we produce. But it's at least going to give us our first taste of the BNS invariant for the Torelli group. So how will we do this? Okay, so this, is, this, is, this is step one. And so I'm going to leave this here so I can write step two afterwards. So the, uh, we have to have some mechanism to cook up elements inside the BNS invariant. And so here is the main tool. This is going to be sort of the main non-mapping class group black box I used during this talk, other than the BNS theorem, is the following folklore lemma. So here's a folklore lemma. Right, so this has been written down in many places in many forms. And what does it say? So let's say that we have that G is a, uh, you know, a, a group with finite gen set S. So let's assume that the following graph is connected. So the vertices are elements of S, and the edges 
this is going to be sort of record what elements of the generating set commute. Okay, so we have an edge from S to S prime if S and S prime commute. Okay, and so then what happens? Well, then we have a condition, a conclusion very similar to what happens in step one. So you look at all elements rho inside of the all the characters rho of g, and such that rho of little s is non-zero for all s inside s, well, that is contained inside the d and s invariant of g. So as I said, I'm not going to prove this. This is sort of been proven by many, many people. By There's like 50 different definitions of the DNS invariant. There's a pr different proof for every definition. This definition I gave you is not the most convenient one for proving this, I should say. <laughs> but it can be done. It can be done. Uh, what some, maybe why is this somehow reasonable? Well, you sort of see, I think of the BNS invariant as a duel between commuting, like in the Z to the N, and non-commuting, like in the free group, right? These are the sort of the two extreme behaviors. Lots of things finally generated, not a lot of things finally generated. And so what this says is that if you have a lot of commuting going on, a lot of abelianness happening inside your group, then you, the BNS invariant is sort of forced to be large, okay? But there's proofs of this using like group actions on real trees and stuff. There's a lot of different proofs of this result. Anyway, so we want to apply this to the Torelli group, and so therefore we need a generating set. <coughs> now, thankfully, so Johnson's generating set for the Torelli group is ginormous and really hard to work with, and thankfully we don't actually need to know anything about it. So here is a lemma, which, <coughs> so, well, that folklore lemma right there is somehow not obvious, especially for the definition I gave of the BNS invariant. The following lemma will be obvious to almost everyone in this room. Okay, so <laughs> the, uh, that's the following lemma. So the graph, so <laughs> it's a challenge, right, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> DPG, so is connected, and I'll tell you what this is, for G at least four, and so the vertices, these things are genus one DPs, so T, you know, which look like, you know, so there is one right there. There's x and there's y. Let me give myself, I said this is connected for g at least 4, so let me give myself some extra genus. And the edges are uh, disjoints. Without. So, you know, so the, uh, you know, this is like a curve complex of BPs, right? You know, so instead of the curve, instead of the elements being, uh, being single curves, we have two disjoint homologous curves like that, and edges are disjointness. So an edge would look something like this, right? You know, and you see, you need the genus to be at least four for there to be even one edge in this complex. But everything, every way you know to prove the curve complex is connected will also prove this is connected. Like it's not a, you know, it's not, you know, it's, this is how all these complexes work, right? Like once you have one edge, it's connected, right? You know. <laughs> Anyway, so why is that good right there? So now, what do we take? So what we do is we take S. <coughs> so this S that we're looking for up there to be the uh, vertices of this BP graph, BP, so that so spanning a finite connected subgraph. So, and containing a gen set for Torelli. That's all you have to do, right? You know. So you have a generic set for Torelli, so that consists of finally. <laughs> I was hoping to dance. So that's why when I teach calculus and someone's phone goes off and there's music, I always start dancing until, until they shut it off because it makes everyone uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you just take those finally many generators for Torelli, and then you just sort of fill it in, take the convex hole, that, that's pretty connected. Okay? So, and that, that proves step one. So step one is, it looks hard, but, it's actually, but assuming that folklore element, it's, it's really not so bad. Of course, we know nothing about this, about S, except for what I wrote up there, you know. I, for goodness sake, I don't want to try to draw pictures of it. I don't even know what they would look like. Okay, so what's step two? And, you know, I actually gave myself just enough time to make it to where step two should appear. Step two is right here. Uh, so it says, 
Let me write, I chose an efficient way to write it down. So let's consider some element rho inside the dual of the Torelli group. This is well, non-zero. Of course, the zero character is always in there. That's not very interesting. And so then the following is true. So there exists some element f inside the mapping class group. So I want to make a little observation. I'll make this right here. <coughs> so the mapping class group that acts on the Torelli group by conjugation, right? After all, it's a normal subgroup. So we get that action right there. And that induces an action on the dual, right? So mod g that also acts on the set of homomorphisms from Torelli d'Ars, like the dual action, right? And so what, this, what the step two says is that given any non-zero character, we can find some element f inside the mapping class group such that if we hit, and you know, I'm putting my action up there, I have to write, it's the right action naturally. I don't want inverses to show up. Uh, such that rho f of s doesn't equal zero for all s inside s, okay? So rho might vanish on some elements of this massive generating set. But if I skew it, I hit it with some like sufficiently complicated element of the mapping class group, I can force it to be non-zero on every single element of my generating set. Okay? And so hence, of course, you know, and hence this implies that f is inside the uh, BNS invariant virtually, which is what I wanted to show. That way, that'll complete the proof of the result. Mm -hmm. F is in the mapping class group? Yes, f is inside the mapping class group. Row. And I'm giving pro Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Row, yeah, yeah. This is row to the f. Row to the f so the, is the next, the next line. line. Oh, yeah. That's what I meant, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, that's a really non professional noise to make when I make a mistake, isn't it? <laughs> so, anyway, we can't all be dead. So, uh, so, 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 this will complete the proof. <laughs> this will complete the proof of the result. Okay, so, I'm going to raise that up there and I'm going to start working on that now. And I've got about enough, enough time to complete the proof of this. Okay, so how am I going to do this? You know, so what do I want to do? So this is going to involve you know, a little point set topology. <laughs> so strange enough. So the uh, I've always wanted to, you know, somehow when I was a student, you know, I, I was maybe like 18 years old, and I learned some point set topology, and I thought this is the greatest thing in the world, and it was a sort of disappointment when I learned that that wasn't real math anymore. So you know, it was sort of a joy that I get to use a non Hausdorff space today. So here is the outline, the strategy. So for element s inside s, let's set, I'm going to call this z sub s, it's for the zero set of s. That right there is the all elements f inside the mapping class group such that, uh, what? Such that rho f of s is uh, equal to zero, okay? And so what do we have to show? It's enough to show, show that if you take the union, this is all topological, of all elements inside S of Z sub S, then that right there is a proper subset of the mapping class group, right? Because then the, the element I'm looking for is anything that's not inside that union. Okay? So how might I possibly do that? So row is the fixed step. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm in step two, so row is a fixed non-zero character. Okay? And so this so z is the best depends on, on row, right? You know? So now what am I gonna do? So so how might how might I do that? So let me uh, do some, as I said, you know, let me define a sort of funny topological space, you know. This is unfortunately, like, you know, I'd like to say that this space will make Maladin happy, but Maladin likes like plain compacted, not non hausdorff spaces, you know. He likes, re you know, the good part of points in topology. <laughs> so, Manger manifolds and stuff like that. Manger <laughs> manifolds are hausdorff. Yeah, that's right. I say, so you like hausdorff spaces, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. So, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, what am I going to do here? So, let's define it. Did you say it's one of kind of white, so now we'll show that one? Uh, because, once I've shown that, the element f I'm looking for is any element that's not inside that union. Right? Just, that is literally what I'm asking for. I just reverse, I just reverse that one. What would you say? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, oh yeah, 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 that means proper containment. Oh, that's a cross right there. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's a cross right there, yeah. So it's not the whole thing. And so let's let psi 
be the map from the mapping class group to the automorphism group of the dual of Torelli right here. So now, uh, Torelli is currently generated, so that right there is like GL <coughs> in R for some R, right? And so this right here has a, house, has a Zariski topology. And so let's give, so mod G, so the side pullback of the Zariski topology. So the open sets inside the mapping class group are the row pre-images of open sets inside GL and R under the Zersky topology. Okay? So that's a topology. Every element of the Torelli group is inside every open set. Right? So it's kind of really not also. But, uh, but you can do it. So let's see what we can say about it. So there are sort of two things. And then we'll, we'll, I'm going to make two claims that will imply the enough to show it. Okay? So a claim. So what I said this is a bad space, but it's not so bad. So uh, mod G is an irreducible topological space. Now let me remind you what irreducible means. Irreducible means it's not the union of two proper closed subsets. Okay? You, you, most people learn that when they're thinking about varieties, right? So it's not, so if you have two, I mean, two closed subsets of the mapping class group, their union's the whole thing, one of them better be the whole thing, okay? So it's not like the, you know, the Zariski topology on the union of the x and y axis. So, uh, how do you prove this? Well, let's think about how we did this thing right here. So we have this map from the mapping class group. So that's going all the way over here to the automorphism group. Uh, Torelli G star. And of course, you know, so th th we're looking at the action of the mapping class group by conjugation on the Torelli group on that, some, and we're looking at the dual, so that's something abelian. So therefore, uh, this factors through the quotient of the mapping class group in the Torelli group. So this factors through so the symplectic group. So there is SP to G Z right there. Now, of course, SP to G Z is contained inside SP to G of R right there. And it turns out that that action factors through, the, through SP2GR. That's actually a theorem of Johnson. You might have heard, if you know the Johnson homomorphism, this is Johnson's theorem saying that the uh, abelianization of the Torelli group rationally is just which 3 of H mod H. So what this is really is, uh, yeah, this is just, this is really like the dual of which 3 of H mod H secretly. But, Anyway, that's good enough. So, so, so you, you sort of it's this this part is obvious. That's a little bit less obvious, but it's true. So now this thing right here, that's a lattice. <coughs> so hence, it's a risky dense inside SP2GR. Okay, by the Borel density theorem. Or in this case, you just prove it with your damn bare hands. It's not hard. So, and then, uh, but SP2GR, that's a connected algebraic group, right? So algebraic group, and so hence it's irreducible. So if you have a, an algebraic group, you know, it's some variety and it's connected if and only if it's irreducible. That's not, that's a classical result, it's not hard to show. And so that, that check, that's all we had to show. So SP2GZ is, is it, that's an irreducible topological space under the Zersky topology and so is that. So, so check, okay? So any questions about that claim? So the important thing here is the symplectic group is connected. So uh, what else do we have to do? So I also, next I have to show that these are proper subsets, right? So that's claim two, which will show up right here. I've got enough time to prove it. So by the way, while I raise, why are uh, why are why are connected algebraic groups irreducible topological spaces? Well, if they had two, if they had two. Uh, <laughs> two like components as algebraic varieties, and they were you know, and it, but it was still connected. They have to cross somewhere, right? And where like the x and the y axis, and so there there be a singularity right there. But algebraic groups are very homogeneous, and so that would say that every point was singular. That's just never true. That's not true for a variety. Every variety is a smooth point somewhere. So that's where that's where that's going. 
So here's the second claim, which will imply the enough to show. Claim. So z sub s is a proper closed subset of mod g. Okay? And then if it's an irreducible, so you know that says, you know, it can't be the union of these z sub s's if they're all proper closed subsets. So closed is clear, right? Because they're zero sets, right? They're things where some function vanishes, and so that's not an issue. The issue is why aren't they the whole thing? So assume, so to the contrary, that z sub s is in fact the whole mapping class group. Okay, and let's see if we can get a contradiction. So how are we going to do that? Well, so let's write, uh, so s is equal to tx, ty inverse, where this number s is going to be our generator. It's going to be some genus 1 bp map, right? There it is. Some more genus right there. There's x and there's y. Okay, and so then what do we have? So then, for all elements f inside the mapping class group, what do we have? Well, by definition, 0 is equal to rho to the f of s, right? That is literally the definition of z sub s. Why is that a problem? Well, let's just write out what that means. That is, by definition, and oh, you know, it's a right action, it's a left action, I don't know. So it's, uh, <laughs> I think that's f s, that's probably actually f inverse s f. But let's pretend it's the other one, okay? <laughs> so what is that? Well, that's rho of... So f, tx, ty inverse, f inverse. And I think that right there is rho of t of f of x, t of f of y inverse, right? OK, but remember, uh, this is true for every <coughs> single, uh, you know, every single f. And if you think about the orbit of a single genus 1 bp under f, that's every single genus 1 BP by the uh, change of coordinates principle, right? So this is also all genus 1 BPs by change of coordinates. And so, but these generate, so Torelli G, right? And so thus we see that in fact rho is equal to zero, which is a contradiction. Okay, so it vanishes. Let me raise it up so people can see it. So this assumption implies that uh, that rho vanishes on every single genus one BP. Therefore, it vanishes in the whole Torelli group. Therefore, it was zero. But you see, in step two, you assume it's not zero because it's true that zero was always inside the BNS invariant as I've defined it. So, and uh, I think that completes the proof. So thank you. Still prove that goal theorem for them? Not well. The thing is, if that's not true, that's not. I don't know if that's true or not. Okay. So, so the problem with these things. Remember, I'm only dealing with the lower central series of the Turing problem. I'm not dealing with the derived series, right? If I kept doing this, I would actually get that every term in the derived series was inside there. So I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. So you know. So that, so so this is really uh, a lower <coughs> central series theorem, not a derived series. Theory. So so it's, you have to be able. You, see, you don't show that's the whole thing. You show that there's a lot of it in there. That is big enough to get the next term in the lower century series. And the, the, another problem, you, I, I should say, like another subtlety that shows up here, is you see, I'm really using the fact that Torelli is generated by genus 1 BPs, right? But I want to do this inductively. I act, it doesn't tell me a generating set here. They're coming in separate. So I can't do this argument inductively, right? Because I don't get a generating set for the next term. So I have to be, I have to work harder. <laughs> so, you know, you have to sort of somehow be a lot, work in a lot softer of a way, but it takes more work to do it. So. Yes? The, the theorem of Johnson that you mentioned, do you mean that the map from SPTPC extends to the map from SPTPR? That's right, yeah. Theorem? Exactly, yeah. But, it, but in fact, he shows more. What he shows, in fact, is that, um, what does Johnson's theorem say? This is an amazing theorem. It's really hard. Uh, yeah, no, 
this is a sequence. Johnson, so Johnson was sort of a sort of a hobo, right? So he wrote these theorems when he was living in, the, in a trailer in the woods, snowed in during a snowstorm. So I think it's a sequence of three amazing papers. The first is, as far as I know, the only analyst that ever was written by a homeless person. You know, it's, it's an accomplishment, right? So, but what did he show in this case? He showed that for G at least three, if you look at uh, H1 of the Torelli group G with coefficients of R, that thing right there is wedge 3 of h mod h, where h is h1 of sigma g with coefficients in r, right? And so that's what, uh, so, so hence, what we see from that is that Torelli g dual is the same thing as, well, it's wedge 3 of h. Don't, h embeds inside wedge 3 of h in some way. Don't worry about where, how it does. Just the dual of that, right? So that's that's a representation of the whole real symplectic group, not just the interval symplectic group. So, yeah, that's a, so that, that's what he actually proved. That's what I'm that's what I'm appealing to right there. So, any other questions? Fabulous, thank you.